Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fil awwalin wa salli ila huma wa sallim wa barik ala habibina wa nabiyyina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fil akhirin. Allahumma salli ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kullama dhakarahu dhakirun al abrar wa kullama ghafana dhikri ghafirun. All praise you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what we reveal and knows what we conceal and even knows what the animals feel. We thank him, we praise him, and on him we have reliance. It is to him we only turn to for true guidance. We ask him to send his peace, his blessings, his mercy on the best of human beings and prophets Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Them, on whom be praised until the very end of our days and we ask him for steadfastness guidance mercy and to never lead us astray and for him to save us on judgment day welcome everybody alhamdulillah to our uh, session 18 uh, in the reading and commentary of the book by imam ibn al-jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala which is um, the adab al-hassan al-basri wa zuhdihi wa mawa'idhihi rahimahullah ta'ala uh, which is the character of imam hassan al-basri and his asceticism and his wisdoms and his uh, admonitions uh, by Imam Ibn Jawzi or as claimed to be by, by, by Imam Ibn Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala. We stopped uh, at the last section where uh, he discusses Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu's uh, statement um, and it, it, it had a lot to do with people being able to take advice, people being able to take advice and handle uh, giving advice as well as taking advice and how the earlier generations were able to take that sort of advice. We continue from that kind of um, understanding and, and view uh, where uh, he says, uh, Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that he, uh, Imam Hassan al-Basri used to say, used to say the following. He used to say that المؤمن شعبة من المؤمن يحزن إذا حزن ويفرح إذا فرح. He says that a believer is a branch of a believer. They are saddened if their brother is sad, and they become happy when their when their brother or sister become uh, become happy. And this teaches you that um, the fellowship that faith teaches is what brings humanity together. The fellowship and the companionship and the genuine care that faith teaches completes a human being. That a person doesn't just live this life and says, nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. I only care about me. It's all about what I care. Forget everyone else. No, but rather they feel like they're a part of a socially cohesive network. What affects your fellow man affects you. And even more so. In faith, it increases. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that the example of believers and their mutual love and their mercy and their affection and compassion towards one another are like uh, a building, which its bricks, and he, uh, he uh, brought his uh, fingers together, support one another. So whatever ha harms a believer harms you as well. And that's why... The aspect of, of, of social cohesion in Islam is something extremely important. You don't think that it's just about you and it's all about only what I care for, but rather how it affects those around you. And that is why the, the global Muslim family uh, is, is so cohesive in one. Someone that's in, in, in Central Africa, I care about. Someone in Burma, I care about. In Kashmir, in Afghanistan, or in uh, Pakistan, or in Yemen, or in Atlanta, or Toronto, or... Denmark or wherever we are all connected and that is what makes us love one another and care for one another because that cohesion of not just only humanity but also faith brings us all together and that's why in true reality there's nothing that you will see that shows the diversity of faith like the Muslim uh, like the Muslim uh, nation uh, and that's just very true we'll go to any masjid in the world and you'll see the diversity, or you're supposed to see the diversity. Of course, there's all, always cultural infringement. There's always, uh, unfortunately, communities that have been uh, affected by racism and all kinds. That's all true, 100%. Muslims are not perfect, right? Muslims have their own problems. But it still is the most socially cohesive and diverse community that there is. And that's something that we need to cherish. In essence, uh, understand that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ's prophetic community was an example of this level of social cohesion, what Allah, our Lord, intended for human beings, in essence, to be reunited or gathered or agree upon one thing and one thing only. And that is the worship of the one Lord, uh, the one true God, the creator of all that, all that exists. And that's something incredibly important and exemplified here that in faith, it's, it's much more so. So I want to focus a little bit on this aspect because 
Unfortunately, we seem to have forgotten the, uh, you could say, almost the etiquettes or rights of another believer. You're not allowed to harm and hurl insults at another Muslim. You're not allowed to uh, vilify another Muslim because of a sin. You're not allowed to cancel another Muslim because of your disagreement with them. This is something that you see, unfortunately, Muslims just today, just today, I went on YouTube, just, you know, look at a uh, search uh, on, on YouTube. You know, the ones they say suggested for you because you happen to be Muslim. They pick it up on their algorithms. The vast majority of the most viewed YouTube videos by Muslims is what? Is none other than debates and arguments with Muslims, with each other. Those are the most viewed. One of them had like 700,000 in a debate. Another one had... One million. You know what? Our faith is because has lost adab, has lost etiquette. Not that the faith doesn't have it. Muslims have lost faith in their, uh, have lost the etiquette of their faith, have lost the character of their faith. So when when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu warns and enjoins us not to indulge in, uh, in in argumentation, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wala tujadil." In the Quran, this is not even for the, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Do not argue. Don't have sense of uh, this the sense of argumentation and debate. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet وسلم, if you were to have a discourse with members of the uh, uh, of the community that are from Christians or from, from from Jews or any other faith, look at the order in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, discusses that. Udru ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Call to the way of your Lord with wisdom. Wisdom is to know to, the right thing to say at the right time in the right place. To the right person in every form of right way, that's what that's what hikmah is, which means wisdom. And in Arabic, wisdom has a specific meaning. It's not just you know a person who's wiser and older, but a person who can be younger and understands when to say the right thing at the right time and the right place. And that's incredibly important. So I want you all to just reflect over that component of being able to uh, number one call to things that are. Uh, in terms of correcting others, or if you want to have an input or an opinion, use wisdom. Use wisdom. It's, it's bare common sense that people have lost. Okay? And when it's wisdom, how do you affect somebody? When Even if you're going to say something, you don't use very charged language. Everything is about charged language now. And that's why, honestly, one of the best features they have like now on some social media is to stop allowing people to comment. Because people don't have, people don't have sense. People's comments about everything. And not only that, the people are nitpickers to such a level of degree. You did not think about this one exception that came across my mind. So I'm going to comment on this uh, particular issue. This, this is a bad, bad characteristic to have this, this notion that I always have to pitch in my, my opinion and my two cents. This is a bad characteristic. We should try to stay away from that. Right? When somebody's making a point and you're thinking already in your mind all of the exceptions so I can put, put in a word or two. This is this is not this is not a good characteristic to have. Secondly, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa'udu ila sabili Rabbika bil hikmati wal wal mawidati al hasanati," and with good admonition, with admonition that is that is good. Admi when you're admonishing somebody, by nature the word admonish means it's almost like it's negative. By nature, the word admonish almost refers to something that you're uh, chastising almost. But how does Allah word this admonishment? With admonishment, that is better. Meaning what? When you're admonishing somebody, yes, you're going to be chastising them, but do it in a way that it's going to want from the other person to accept it. Or it says, da'iya ila ila al-qabul in Arabic. They say, you say it in a way where the person that is listening to you, number one, senses genuineness. Number two, senses sincerity. Number three, number three they will accept it from you because of the way you're going about dealing with it. Now, if you're, if you're a person who doesn't know how to handle that, then you shouldn't be admonishing people. Because for you to lose a heart is worse than for you to correct a wrong. You understand this? A lot of Muslims don't understand this. They think that they need to hold a flag and start beating people over the head with it so that they can establish this proverbial truth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضْلًا غَلِيلًا If you were harsh-hearted, the people would have left you and, and turned their backs uh, uh, on you. Right? 
they would have left you the, the way you are. So losing a heart is worse than trying to correct a wrong. And this is something Muslims are losing day by day on social media interaction. They're losing this when they speak to each other. Go look again, like I said, on YouTube. Look at the vast majority of, of videos that are watched by Muslims. What is it? argumentation, hatred, discourse, divisive human beings, clickbait, uh, my commentary on this person said. This is, this is what Muslims are busying their life with. May Allah protect us from being people who busy Muslims from things that are important, but rather creating what? Cash flow cows for themselves in order to comment on this person or that person. It's really saddening. It's really saddening. But in any case, he says in, in the essence of wanting people to uphold the level of character, number one, assume good of people. Number two, when you're going to, when you're going to correct somebody, follow it with the Prophet ﷺ the way he was commanded by. Do it with wisdom. The second, uh, uh, an admonition in the best of ways. And then lastly, number three, if you, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, then what? جَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ Then argue or have discourse and debate with them in a way that is better. These people, subhanAllah, who are cursing them, who are mocking them. This is not the attitude of Islam. I'm sorry. All of these examples that are using, uh, that, that are using uh, the um, approach of saying that we are more like uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab or we are more like Khalid ibn al-Walid, this is complete nonsense. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he stepped foot on the member of Khilafa, he said, oh Allah, I am harsh, so make me soft. And then he got up and he spoke to people. Those who say that Umar is harsh, the harshness of Umar has gone. Why? Because it took Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu all of his uh, training with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And then Umar with Abu Bakr. And then finally when he became a leader, he understood how to employ and how to deal with and how to uh, speak to people. And not use a level of harshness with them that's not warranted. So I want you all to understand, like this attitude of I'm going to be Omar on people, this is complete nonsense. This is batil. No one has this kind of attitude. A person should say, I'm going to follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is our rubric in how to deal with others. Not anyone else. Don't quote me as another person when we say the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said this. To the extent people are mocking this and saying, don't take out the adab card. Don't tell me the adab card right now. Don't tell me I mean, what kind of what kind of attitude is this? Allahu alam, Allahu alam. And the Prophet and, and the Prophet وسلم, emphasized that the believers are like what? Are like a building that support one another. So how are you supposed to support one another when you're trying to break somebody down? How are you supposed to support one another when you say you're you're off of it, you're crazy or you're a lunatic or you're all of these things that people say? So in essence, if there's a disagreement, if there's a disagreement we have with others. The disagreement should come based on, hey, how can we come to some mutual agreement? Or we will not agree on this issue. No problem. But there's no way, there's no reason to draw lines in the sand and say, you know, you're conservative, I'm liberal, you're secular, I'm this. And you know, this these these kind of things that have spread amongst Muslims has just drawn more and more problems than they have uh, in essence uh, solved any solutions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Oh, you who believe, obey Allah and His Messenger and those of authority over you. They say the scholars or at least the, the rulers, the Muslim, Muslims who, uh, those who rule by Islam. And if you differ over something, over a matter, then take it back to Allah and His Messenger. Take it back to Allah and His Messenger. Where, what is the basis of unity? And subhanAllah, what are you going to do? We, we're going to keep saying it until we're blue in the face. Because that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us. If no one's even listening, we still call to the truth. If no one wants to, uh, if they still want to watch their clickbait videos and watch their arguments and, and people and Muslims fighting with each other online, that's their business. But in essence, we are commanded to have an elevated discourse, to have a scholastic mindset, to not be... Uh, to not be people who are lewd and to stoop down to the level of chatter and gossip online and making videos about this nonsense. So in any case, that's something that is referred to here, a believer is a branch of a believer. 
they are saddened if their brother is sad. How does it make you happy that someone else makes a mistake? How is it making you happy that you're winning an argument by proving somebody has committed a sin? And people who have that, they have diseases in their hearts. May Allah protect us. They become happy when their brother is happy. Al-Hasan used to say, you gain from having a good companion, a khalil. Therefore, choose your brothers or your sisters and friends and disregard any of their shortcomings. Allahu Akbar. In Arabic, let's, let's read it in Arabic because the Arabic is much more beautiful. Inna laka min khalilika nasiban fatakhayyar al-ikhwana wal-ashab wajanib al-amr al-ladhi yu'ab. Listen to this. Again, you have a portion or you have a portion from your closest friends. Okay? You take a portion. Nasib. Nasib means what? You are going to take some of their characteristics, some of their habits, some of the way they, uh, the way they speak, uh, some of the way that they're going to deal with others. You're going to take a nasib from your closest companions. And, and go, you don't have to search far and wide. Look at yourself. Look at your friends around you. Don't you start saying some of the same language that they even use? Some people say, oh, cap and no cap, right? You just start using cap and no cap. That's just normal. And, you know, you might have not even known what that means until your friends start using it, for example. Or you start using certain language. For Similarly, you're going to use certain characteristic from them. You're going to take some element of their manners. So he says, you gain, you, you take a portion from good companionship. A good, close companion. We said Khalil is the closest companions to you. He says, therefore, choose your brothers or sisters and your friends wisely and disregard anything that you find of their shortcomings. Disregard. Why? Because they're going to have shortcomings as well. When you're so close to somebody, what are you going to start noticing more? Okay. If I hold up a book like this, okay, you're not going to understand. You're not going to see anything from this far. But when I start bringing it close to you and you start reading it, you're going to start noticing mistakes. Oh, the, I think this was a mistake. Oh, look, there's there's a uh, there's an error at, in the top of, uh, part of, of this page. So the more you get closer to something, the more you're going to notice the shortcomings. The more you're going to notice deficiencies. The more you're going to notice that this person needs to work on this and that. So he says, when you're when you're in essence trying to be a friend, be a good friend, and don't start nitpicking over people's shortcomings. Allah Akbar. This is Islam. Look at the beautiful manners of Hassan al Basri. When you get to the level of being close to friends, don't look for their shortcomings and their sins and their deficiencies. If you do, guess what? There's a golden principle here. Remember, treat others as if you would like for them to treat you. The golden principle or the golden rule. Listen to this. If you start looking out for the deficiencies in other Muslims and more impo most importantly, your own friends, Allah will give you friends that will look out at and look for your deficiencies. Why? The reward is equal to the type of action that you do, whether it's good or it's bad. So when you start looking and pointing fingers and trying to find your nitpicky comments and advices and all these things that people say, nitpicky. Not that you're trying to actually have some discourse, just nitpicking. Ah, I have something to say. Oh, you forgot this nuance. Actually, and then they go off and start discussing. Don't be that kind of person. Because Allah will bring you friends that are like that with you. And wallah, that's true. You've seen it. Okay? He continues, he said, he used to say, refrain from some affairs. For a person may eat food, enter a place and sit in a gathering, yet they are not sincere in it. Their religion leaves them while they're oblivious to all of that. Let's read this in Arabic. تَرَفَّعُوا عَنْ بَعْضِ الْأَمْرِ فَإِنَّ الرَّجُلَ لَيَأْكُلَ الْأَكْلَةَ وَيَدْخُلُ الْمَدْخَلَ وَيَجْلِسُ الْمَجْلِسَ بِغَيْرِ قَلْبِهِ وَيَذْهِبُ دِينُهُ وَهُوَ لَا يَشْعُرُ So what is this, what is this lesson saying? I want you all to, to just reflect over this. This is saying to, uh, to us something very important. And that is that if you do not care for where you sit and with whom you sit and what enters your mind and enters your heart, and this does not only include gatherings, this also includes the input from media, the music that you're listening to, 
the 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 Netflix things that you're taking lightly. Oh, it's oh, it's just a it's just a porno, pornographic scene. I've seen a million of those, so it's, it doesn't matter. Oh, it's just uh, it's just this uh, you know, haram uh interaction that I've gotten used to. When a person starts to become desensitized to haram, or desensitized to the gatherings of haram, where people are like they're smoking weed, they're drinking alcohol, they're doing whatever, and they become desensitized to these kind of gatherings, what happens? He says, a person may eat food. They may enter a place and sit in a gathering in which their heart is not in it. Meaning what? This gathering has absolutely zero benefit in terms of rectification or refinement of the heart. It's literally almost like bombarding your heart and deadening it. What does Allah say in the, in the first chapters of the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah? بَرَّانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Ra Rather, Allah placed a cover over their hearts. And that's what happens when you're uh, consistently engaging in that which is, you know, going to put place darkness over your heart. Then there is no place for light to enter. You're the one shading your heart with all of the sin. And that is why a person that, that that's finding difficulty in, in, in clarity in their mind, clarity in their heart, clarity and sincerity has uh, difficulty feeling their worship, difficulty in making dua, difficulty in, in genuinely um, enjoying their salah. All of it starts off with what? Number one, your eyes. The Prophet has said in a hadith which has weakness in it, but its uh, its meaning is true, which is that a person who lowers their gaze from that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade, Allah will place in their heart a sweetness of faith that they can taste. So what is that? What is the what does this mean? Number one, that your faith and your your enjoyment of faith and your understanding of faith and the clarity you have of it is tied to things you see. If you look at haram, or if you are with haram, or you engage in haram, then you're gonna say, Oh, well, I can't focus in my dua, or why is my dua not being said? Why is my prayer not being accepted? Why am I not calling and it's not being answered? Why don't I enjoy it as much? Because where is the place for the light when you're preventing it with shadows of darkness of sin? So the one who wants to enjoy and find clarity, they must give up the darkness of sin for light to enter. And if somebody wants a direction with, with, with illuminated guidance, they must follow the light. You can't, you can't sit in an alley with, and on your right are drug dealers and on your left are women of the night. And in front of you is, is, uh, is a club and all kinds of things. And you're saying, man, I, I don't know why I feel this way. Well, wh why are you in this environment? You see a light at the end of the alley. You have to follow the light for you to be illuminated with it. Similarly, this is what Imam Al-Hassan Al-Basri, he says. He says that a person will sit in a gathering that their heart is not in. That their heart is not in. They don't find a level of tranquility. They don't find a level of peace. They don't find a level of solace. And they don't find that it's, it's spiritually healthy. You're, how many of us have been in gatherings where you actually feel sick? You feel sick. Why? Gossip around you. Disgusting language. Uh, horrible manners. People nitpicking at each other, people after each other because of materialism. How many of us have been in those kind of gatherings? You feel literally sick. I, I, I know a person that they said, I've been in those kind of gatherings constantly and it makes you want to throw up. It makes you want to throw up because the heart is not, is, is not comfortable with that level of, 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 of sickness around it. So what happens, he says, if a person sits in a gathering that their heart is not in, their faith, their deen leaves them while they're oblivious. Their, their way of life, their faith leaves them while they're oblivious. Why? Because of so much that they've become desensitized to. They've become desensitized to. Be wary. Don't take these things lightly. Don't think, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go to one party. I'm just gonna go wrong. I'm just gonna go to a club once. I just want to see how it is. I just want to see how it is. I want to uh Oh, I, I, my surroundings are with these, with these women or these guys that gossip all the time, uh, and it's fine. I'm just trying to, you know, uh, impact them. You know what? Maybe you're not being impacted. Maybe you need to take a step away for you to impact them, because if you're being influenced negatively and you, you don't have a chance to assert yourself, you have to take your ways, take. You have to take and uh, take yourself away and focus on self-preservation, and that's no problem.
for you to take away negative influences of your spirituality. And again, there's exceptions. Don't, don't, don't let your mind wander, oh, what about my family? You know, I have to be here. Okay, please don't, don't think of exceptions. Take the rule and apply it with common sense. If you're at a gathering with like an elder or someone else who has issues gossiping and speaking about people, just be nice and cordial and say, you know what, uh, change the subject. Or, or say, you know, hey, let's, uh, uh, let's talk about this issue. Did you guys hear what happened? On, you know, have some common sense. Don't, don't let your mind wander to every single exception and then try to make a rule out of it. Okay. So uh, Imam Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah ta'ala, he continues by saying, it was said to him, it was said to him, so, meaning a person came up to Imam al-Hassan al-Basri and he said, oh, Abu Sa'id, some people come together uh, and come to gatherings and listen to this they pick out mistakes you make in your speech in order to defame you are you listening listen oh abu saeed some people come to gatherings and pick out mistakes you make in your speech in order to defame you so he replied oh my brother or oh son of my brother oh my cousin do not be bothered by it. I will be satisfied if I enter Jannah, if I enter paradise, and be in the company of Ar Rahman, be in the company of the Most Merciful and the Anbiya. Alayhim is salam. It does not bring satisfaction that I am protected from the people and their speech. It's not going to satisfy me. Why? Because I'm my satisfaction is something greater. My satisfaction is I have a bigger goal. Who? Why do I care that this person or that person has something to say about me? And I, you know what? I need this advice more than anyone because it bothers. It bothers me. Somebody's speaking about me. Somebody uh, has has something evil to say. Somebody says uh, words or makes memes about me. Yeah, that bothers. I'll be, I'll be the first one to say it. Right? We're we're in the public eye. People speak about us. Of course, I'm going to be upset. Someone saying something that's not that's not okay. Someone says, uh, you know, in terms of uh, social media or something like that, right? So this is one of the greatest advices of Imam Hassan al-Basri. He says, listen, it's your objective. If, you, if your objective is trying to please people, Imam al-Shafi'i has a beautiful statement for you. He says, nas ghayatun la tudrak. Trying to please people or trying to make people satisfied with you is a objective that is unreachable. You cannot reach this objective. So don't try. There's always going to be someone that loves you and there's always going to be people that hate you and there's always going to be people in the middle that they are not, in essence, that concerned as you are about the fact that there's people who criticize you. Okay? So, number one. And he says, number two, look, what is your objective? Is the objective to care about what other people have to say? Or is your objective to reach the acceptance of Ar-Rahman? And have the companionship of Al Habib. So, <laughs> what is it? If your objective is higher, then don't, don't lower yourself to this kind of discourse. Don't lower the scale, this, yourself uh, to this kind of discourse. So, uh, he says something beautiful at this it does not bring satisfaction that I'm protected from people and their speech. He says here, um, at the end of it, وَلَمْ أُطْمِعْهَا فِي السَّلَامَةِ مِنَ النَّاسِ Listen to this. I will not be satisfied if I am protected by people. What does this mean? I want to I I sh- share with you all. Even the prophets were not protected from the mouths of people. I want, okay, look, everybody's upset when somebody writes about you or makes a comment about you. Isn't that right? I want you to imagine how the Prophet ﷺ felt when they used to call him names and spread that throughout the entire city. And he's like, I'm not insane. I'm not, I'm not somebody that deals with devils. I'm not somebody that, that has mental problems. And that's what they used to say about him all, time, all the time. So if the prophets were not free from, from having haters and trolls in essence, neither are you. If the prophets were not free from the blame of people who have no good faith. How many people do you know that they are, in essence, people of bad faith? They are bad faith. They carry bad faith. And they're 
by name Muslim, but none of their actions speak for Islam. Their character is miserable. They're divisive. They speak in horrible language. No one is safe from their, from their tongues. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Aisha, the worst of people is that are those that people avoid because they're trying to save themselves from their lewdness and their bad behavior. Those are the worst people. It's an authentic hadith. There are Muslims that way. Yes, Muslim doesn't mean, mashallah, you're now an angel, but there are unfortunately people like that. So, in essence, if the prophets were not saved from this kind of speech, then what about others like us? That's one. Number two, I want to share with you one of the most beautiful stories that I love. Musa alayhi salam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a beautiful question. He said, Oh Allah, my Rabb, Ya Rabbi, stop allowing people to say things about me which are not true. Listen. Musa, Moses, asked Allah, our Lord, stop people from saying things about me which are not true. So do you know what do you know what Allah said? Oh Musa, I did not write this for myself. How do you think I will allow it for you? Allah, Allah. Okay. He said, I didn't write this for myself. How many people speak about Allah falsehood and lies? God has this and God has children and God is God is one, does not have anything. They, and how many people lie about Allah? How many people make lewd jokes about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Jalla Jalalu Azza wa Jal. So he said, I didn't write this for myself. You think I'm going to write it for you, O Musa? Meaning what? Someone asked a, a question which relates to the answer. The answer has come to you. How do we get rid of bad vibes? The way you get rid of bad vibes is by fixing your reaction. You get rid of bad vibes with your reaction and adjusting it. That's how you get rid of bad vibes. Because why? B vibes will stop cease, will not stop ceasing to exist. People's negativity and toxicity and their divisiveness will not cease. Maybe even from the closest people to you in, in your faith. The way to change that is your reaction to it. If someone is not, is not physically affecting your life, why are you allowing them room in your mind and in your heart free of rent, rent free? Why? What, what benefit is there? But you know what? It bothers me. So who's, who's in charge of that? You are. You have to take control of that. And the people who say, I think too much, go to psychology today. I challenge you. Go to psychology today, the magazine that's full of psychologists and, and counseling professionals, and type the solution for overthinking. Do you know what they say? The solution for overthinking is stop overthinking. That's a psychologist. They're telling you, take your mind off of things that don't have a direct effect on you. How do you do that? A number of ways. Busy yourself with those people who are positive. What have we been saying for the past like hour? Take your group of, pe of, of people that are negatively affecting you and redirect it to people who positively affect you. Because you can't, you, you can't be, live in a space which is completely negative. You always have to replace it. There has to be a group of friends. There has to be someone that has a level of what? Positive influence over you. Number two, the level of influence that a person may have on you should be equal to the amount or the level of effect they have in your life. Say this to yourself. How much is this person affecting my life based on what they say? Are they stopping your food from coming? Are they stopping your, uh, your, your paycheck? Are they affecting you in any sem like real way or no? Let it fall over you like water because it doesn't matter. Keep it moving, as one of my teachers used to say. We used to complain to him. And to this day, look, I, I'm more deserving of this advice than anyone, for sure. right? But it's very difficult for you to not be offended at somebody who does not matter. So if it doesn't matter, move on. How you have a bigger goal? And lastly, reminding yourself, as, as Imam Hassan al-Basri reminded us here, that what is, what is your objective? What is your objective? Remind yourself of your objective. If your objective is the pleasure of Allah, then you're, you don't care what these people have to say. If what they say is true, then correct yourself. 
And if what they say is false and they're being divisive and, and toxic, what, why, are you, why are you making your, your, your mental state much worse by over-focusing on something that does not bring you any sense of benefit or harm? So these things are you, you just remind yourself with, and you can read up more on it. It doesn't go outside of what I've mentioned. It doesn't go outside of what I mentioned. You know, Hassan Basri continues and he says, the one who seeks knowledge for the sake of Allah will indeed by will be will indeed by ma, uh, be manifested in their awe of Allah their khushur their tranquility their peace their asceticism their detachment from materialism and their humility these three things i want you all to reflect on this okay the one who seeks knowledge it will show on them in three different realms Number one, their khushur. Their khushur, khushur is level of tranquility. For example, like you're saying khushur in salah. Khushur in salah is uh, in essence to be tranquil in prayer. Okay, tranquil in prayer. How does this level of tranquility, when you learn more, you learn that you can make dua in salah, you learn that you, you learn the meanings of the Quran, you learn the meanings of the prayer itself, so you have meaningful prayer. So the more knowledge you have, the more knowledge of the Quran that you're going to recite, that brings you what? That brings you a level of tranquility, peace, focus, and connection. Khushur. And it increases them as manifested also in their aestheticism, their zuhd. You know what zuhd is? Zuhd is to detach yourself from anything material in this life. Stop being attached to the material. So many people, look at, look at everybody. Everybody wants to change their lips. Everybody wants to change their nose. Everyone wants to change their... What it, like People are not content anymore with who they are. And that's what Allah says in the Quran. When you don't have contentment, when you're so materially attached of how people perceive you, what is what does Allah subhanahu wa say? Fa'ansahum anfusahum. Nasullah fa'ansahum anfusahum. They forgot Allah, so Allah made them forget themselves. SubhanAllah. Isn't this a form of forgetting yourself? You lose complete existential value in your own eyes. Why? Because you did not value what Allah had to say. You did not value your relationship with your Lord and your Creator. So when that happens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you lose value of yourself. When a person doesn't feel like they're worth anything. And that is why self-worth comes first and foremost. All of this self positive self-image psych psychology and so forth, it does not come from how you see yourself. It comes first of how your relationship is with Allah. And then it comes to how you view yourself, the confidence that you have, and the fact that you are pleased and content with Allah as your Lord and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as your prophet and Islam as your deen. Islam as your deen is the prophet and the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as your prophet. So when you reach this level of contentment, then you can be content with yourself because you're content with this way of life. You're content with not having to be apologetic. You're content with not trying to prove, having something to prove. Because people who are not content, you know what they do? They try everything to garner people's approval. And that, what is zuhd? Zuhd is detaching from the approval of creation. Zuhd is detaching from every material manifestation of I'm trying to seek someone's attention. Okay? And I, I want you all to just kind of reflect over that deeply. Because in essence, much of humanity is busied in this regard. Their money, their wealth, their time is spent consistently on what? Garnering other people's acknowledgement. Did you acknowledge me? Did you notice me? And if you didn't, then I'm depressed. And that is why I have no problem saying, listen to me very carefully. Seeking clout culture is minor shirk. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said? He says, Riyah, showing off is minor shirk. Shirk is to attribute partners to Allah. So in essence, people who are seeking, I want to translate that in a term you can understand. Riyah is showing off. How do you show off now? People who seek clout and they will do anything for clout now. And it's a form of minor shirk. Seeking clout is a form of minor shirk. Stop, stop seeking for the likes and the, and, the, and the attention. If it comes for you because you're, you're sharing something, well, whatever, that's not in your hands. But if you're dying in your mentality over, oh, who shared and why didn't they share? Oh, this person made this kind of comment. Your entire life is based on what? Such attachment to the nominal reactions of others. And hence why? 
when a person seeks increases their knowledge, it manifests of their understanding of true reality. Remember, we said knowledge increases you in four realities. The reality of knowing yourself, the reality of knowing your Lord, the reality of this life and the reality of the hereafter. And you will not be able to manifest understanding. Imam al-Ghazali said this in Kimya al-Sa'ada, Al Alchemy of Happiness. And he said, you are, you are not going to understand the reality of God unless you know your true reality first. Those who don't know themselves will not know their Lord. Wow. And that's why it's among the greatest forms of development is, is none other than this system that Islam teaches us, subhanAllah. Okay, and the third one, the last one, is that the, the, the last portion of how knowledge will manifest uh, uh, itself or show its uh, effects is in tawadu, in humility. A person who, who gains knowledge and you see them becoming more arrogant, know that this knowledge is being as, 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 as an evidence against them. Why? Because they're being, this arrogance makes them feel as if they have a status higher than the people that don't. Okay? And this arrogance teaches the complete opposite of what our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught. And that is, if you can say the number one characteristic of the message of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in terms of its effect on people is what? Is tawadu, is humility. Humility. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka darul akhirah. And that is the abode of the hereafter, meaning the, the paradise. For those that do not want elevation in this life or corruption or corrupting it, and the final uh, result or the final affair is, is for those who are conscious of their Lord. So what do they don't want? They don't want rifa, they don't want elevation. They don't want to stat it. They don't want to show off. They don't want to seem arrogant and boastful and prideful, right? So the, the humility that they have is what elevated them. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu he said in a beautiful hadith, I want you all to reflect on, Man Man The one who humbles themselves for Allah, right? Allah will elevate them. If you humble yourself, you will be elevated. And if you're arrogant, Allah will lower you. In this life and in the next. Okay? So I hope that inshallah you benefited from this. The, the number one mark of a believer, the more they the more they draw closer to their Lord, the more they learn about Islam, they should manifest in three ways. Okay? Pay attention. They should have more tranquility and meaning to their worship. They should, that's called khushur. They should have less and less attachment of the material. And that includes not just physical, but also manifestations of seeking status and clout. And lastly, that they become more and more humble. And also in relationship to that, they stop caring about the acknowledgement of others or their trolling or their hating, or their envy, or their criticism. They're, they're not here for that. And if I'm not here for that, why should I concern myself? Why should I give my time to you? Why should I give my time? My, my, if you cherish your soul, then busy your soul in that which is equal to its value. If someone comes to you with a, with a valueless proposition, come here, let's argue about and calling each other names and, and all this matter. What are you doing? You're actually cheapening the value of your soul by giving time to this person. Isn't that true? Inshallah it is. So inshallah, we're going to actually um, stop here. And if any of you have any questions, you can write them down. Um, there was a few questions earlier that we'll answer. Sheikh, are you still having the book club? Yes, we have a book club called Legacy Literature. For those of you who are interested, uh, you can actually go to um, the Legacy website, which is going to be on your screen for those of you who are in um, on uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook. It's legacy.institute backslash academy. Uh, for those of you who, had, who didn't catch our first book club, we did Islam in the World. 
by Imam Abu Hassan Nadwi. Basically, where, how do we get up here as Muslims? How do we arrive to where we are uh, as Muslims in history, historically? Uh, and what does it take for us to rise back to our uh, grandeur and honor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated us in? Uh, we already did that book. If you want to read that book, we have the recorded sessions, five sessions. You read it at your own pace, and there's a group for interaction with uh, the instructor as well as asking questions and then uh, watching those sessions as you read the book. And then the book we're currently doing is Islam and Secularism by uh, Sayyid Muhammad Naqib al-Attas, Hafizahullah, who's still alive. One of the greatest Islamic thinkers of our time. He's originally Indo Indonesian, but he's of Malaysian, uh, obviously, citizenship. Uh, and he uh, is one of the greatest thinkers of, of our time, speaking about how and what is the solution then to the downfall of Muslims. Where, are we, where do we go from here? Inshallah. I mean, jazakumullah khair. Tips for anxiety. Uh, anxiety is two types. Anxiety, which is clinical. Anxiety, which is spiritual. Anxiety, which is clinical, you have to see, a, of course, a, a specialist for. Uh, and they will work with you in order to give you uh, either uh, best practices in order to re relieve anxiety. Uh, and that's, that's something, it's a medical question. Okay. Uh, as for the spiritual form, uh, of course, every human being has a level of anxiety. Every, every human being has a level of anxiety. The, uh, and the way to relieve that anxiety is to busy your heart with that which will bring it a sense of uh, comfort. And that is through uh, means of meaningful prayer, meaningful dhikr, meaningful Quran recitation, meaningful engagement of classes such as like this. Why? Because it will temper a person's anxiety. Uh, anxiety is uncontrolled the most when a person uh, feels as if they're alone. Or if they're by themselves and allowing their thoughts to take over them. So when you engage your soul in things that will maybe cause it anxiety, uh, uh, relief of anxiety, then the person will uh, find that uh, they've actually engaged. The worst aspect of, of this comes when a person does not engage in something positive. So what? Their anxiety will become uh, will over will overrun them. So this is the, the first and foremost in terms of du'a. Secondly, there are du'as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam spoke about in regards to anxiety. Okay, uh, one of them is Allahumma inni abduka ibn abduka ibn amatik nausiyati biyadik maudun fiya hukmu abdun fiya qadaok asaluka bi kulli ismin huwa laksamaita bihi nafsak wanzaltahu fi kitabik alamtahu ahad min khalqik aw istaathrta bihi fi ilm al ghaybi indaka an tajal al Quran rabi al qalbi wa nur sadri wa jala huzni wa dhahab hami Okay, and if you didn't get that down, just write Allahumma inni abduk, Allahumma inni abduk, and it should show up on on Google, inshallah. Oh Allah, I am your I am your servant, the son of your servant, the son of your female servant. My forelock, my 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 head, the topmost part of my head is in your uh, control and in your hands. Uh, and my the my the justice that I that I will receive is in, is under your uh, discretion. Is under your judgment, okay? I ask you by all of the names that you possess, uh, all of the names that you have, and that you called yourself by, meaning the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, or that you revealed to one of your servants, or, or that you preserved and kept in your own knowledge of the unseen, names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that only He knows, that you send upon me, or that you grant me. And you make the Quran a spring of light. Uh, they spring in my in my heart, and a light of my chest, and a relief of my anxiety and worry and depression. My anxiety and worry. husni wa Okay, and this is among the greatest forms of du'a for lifting anxiety. Also, Allahumma la sahla illa ma jaltahu sahla, wa anta tajal husna ida shi'ta sahla. Oh Allah, there is no ease except that which you put, grant ease. And if you wish to make something of ease, then it will become ease. This is also prophetic dua that you can uh, that you can say, inshallah ta'ala, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. How do we be soft and firm at the same time? Uh, there is no such thing as being soft and firm at the same time. Okay. You are a person who is uh, responsible for people. Uh, and making sure that you do not harm them, okay? 
you there's no there's you don't characterize that as soft and firm as a person who has maturity and a person who understands other people's uh, emotions are something you're accountable for. So it's not something about being hard or soft. And these these kind of terminologies should not be used because why? It's as if saying you you are one or the other. You're either firm or you're either soft. Okay, so that doesn't work that way. You understand that number one, winning hearts is more important than sometimes correcting a diff, a, a, a wrong the wrong way. Okay, so winning that person's heart in order for them for you to change that that wrong is more important. In essence, a person has to use um, a balance between firmness in uh, standing for that which is right and trying to win a person's heart in balance. And that can only be done by looking at specific situations. You can't just get, give a general answer. It depends on situational issues. So for example, a brother or sister does not pray or a wife or husband does not pray. Okay, you can't be, you can't be like, you know, negative and what is wrong with you? And I would be less. Some people even use the words like you're a hypocrite and what kind of Muslim are you? These kind of, this is horrible manners, right? What, will that person ever listen to you? Of course not. They, they will listen to you with love and, and caressing and gentleness and, and a lot of patience, for example. So firmness and softness is not something that you can say. Um, you can say that it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that you can um, generalize. Do we do a live every day? Yes, we do. Tell us about the uh, fitrah. The fitrah is uh, what has innately been created in the human being to believe in God. So every human, uh, we believe that every human being innately has been uh, created with this natural instinct to believe in a Lord and Creator. And that's why even atheists, when they're in, when they're in hardship and difficulty, whether they say, "Oh my God," where did you get that from? Why do you do that? Why do you have that instinct to say, "Oh my God," okay, or "Oh God, why, why X, Y, and Z?" You call out to this divine. And that is because of your natural inclination. Uh, and it's called a fitrah. And there's also characteristics of that fitrah. For example, like cleanliness, purity. And the Prophet ﷺ said there's also physical uh, manners in fitrah. For example, like for men to uh, cut their uh, mustaches, not allowed to go over their lips. So for them to cut. Among the fitrah is also to uh, pluck or shave or to trim the uh, armpits and the private part areas. These are things of the fitrah. Okay. And so on and so forth. How do we access these books, a book club, Legacy? We said that you go to legacy.institute backslash academy. Legacy.institute backslash academy. Okay. Mm. Are there any other questions? All right, we will end it. Best tip to give those who want to get used to picking up the Quran every single day, pick it up every single day. That's the best tip. You have to set a goal and you have to do it. Even if it's just one ayah or, or half, half a page, you, you set this as a goal and you continue it. No one's going to force and give you a magic, magic uh, uh, essence solution. The, the solutions now are do it. I believe that we have sometimes nuanced these ideas of time management and etc. beyond the, the, the very basic things. And we just need to be very empirical. You have to have accountability and you have to be responsible and you have to set something that you so just continuously do. And if that means you don't pick up your phone in your mind, you say, I'm not going to pick up my phone until I've done my Quran, then so be it. That's a self form of a, uh, accountability. Saying, look, today I, I, I'm not going to go on social media until I read my portion of the Quran. This is how people get things done. But as far as like you know, the like these long, extenuating forms of tips and things like that, I, I think sometimes the most basic things are complicated. And I think we just go need to go back to some empirical essence. But I'm sure there's there's tons of books. There's a beautiful book by Sheikh uh, Sulaiman uh, Ghani, okay, which is called 114 Tips on Memorizing the Quran. So you know you can. You can look at that, inshallah. Is it possible to make this live a half hour earlier? No, we can't. Man, uh, can a man see a prospective wife's hair before marriage? Uh, the scholars of Islam differ of how much they can, but this goes back to uh, the uh, comfort of a woman. If a woman is not comfortable, number one, 
the internet is not a safe place. And number two, like there's, there's prospects coming left and right. So a woman is not going to feel comfortable. And number three, like there's other ways to get to understanding to what the physique of a person lo- is like when you're, when you're interested, when I mean, you can ask their friends or whatever. And uh, you can even like, you can tell for the most part, uh, but as far as this infatuation with certain parts of the body, it's not healthy. Yeah. Or a woman, it's not healthy. Uh, but if, if a woman has a defect, for example, in her hair or something like that, she must let the prospective, um, like guy know, like if she, she has hair loss, that's extenuated. There's, there's a certain disease with hair loss. Th- that's an, ex- that's an extreme situation. But in general, uh, the scholars say that whatever, uh, a woman in essence, uh, wears in front of our maharim, then that's what a, a suitor who's serious has definite intention just you know sees in order for him to see but this is not something like you let's have a have a gathering and all it's not, it's not necessarily like that don't be extreme in, in your rigidity of understanding rulings but in whatever way possible this guy sees uh that and like i said i don't trust sharing pictures on the internet i just don't personally that's a personal thing i don't understand um uh, like how in essence that can be normalized to the extent that some women don't feel comfortable if a, if a woman does not feel comfortable, just say you straightforward, you're not comfortable. Don't force a woman to do something she's not comfortable with. So again, there's more than one way to, to see it. And I'm, there, trust me, I mean, at, at some point you get to see uh, enough for you to make a judgment with regards to, you know, what, what you deem as attractive. Well, on. Is keeping dogs inside the house haram? It depends if you're Maliki or not. But keeping dogs inside the house is nothing wrong with, but they have to be uh, placed in a in an area where they eventually sleep, as uh, outside of the actual living quarters of the house. Uh, as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that angels don't enter a place in which there are dogs. There's a question on abortion. There's a really good article by Yaqeen uh, Institute which has uh, discussed the abortion issue for the most part in a very good way. The scholars differ over in soul meant. When does a soul enter the body? And there's a view that it enters the soul at 40 days. As far as uh, extenuating extreme circumstances, for example, a woman who's been raped or things like that, uh, then this is clear. In Islam, it's allowed for her to get her abortion prior to the 40 days. Prior to the 40 days. And there's extreme circumstances which scholars themselves... Uh, will be answered. Will will uh, will be asked, and they will answer inshallah in that situation. It's a situational issue. Is the wife allowed a separate house if she doesn't want to live with in-laws, or just a separate room in the same house? I don't believe answering questions like that is based on legality. I believe questions like that are answered based on mutual discussion and communication. This is a discussion that doesn't is not answered by like a mufti. This is a discussion that's answered by you know. Uh, mutual discussion So communication that's had with a husband and wife Over what they want A, a woman by, by default should uh, Request you know whatever You know she wants From uh, her li- her Expectations and those expectations should, should be something that both parties Agree with and they're mutually Respectful of but you have to also Understand that the vast majority of people Especially now in certain places Of the world don't have the luxury Of having their own house, at their own house. And the expense of going into debt in order to cover this may not be possible and feasible. So this discussion needs to happen over feasibility in a mature way. So that discussion is not a fatwa. That discussion is a communication conflict resolution discussion. So uh, how, how to cater to that? If someone is saying it's my right, is it my right or that right? This language usually results in conflict. Okay? And... The, the husband could say, I, I have the right then to decide. And where is this going? This is not going anywhere positive. So I don't use this kind of language. I don't believe this kind of language will solve the problem. The solve the problem is, is through mutual uh, discussion and, and, and agreement. 
if a, a, a wife wants uh, a place to you know, have her home, this is by default something that a husband should cater to. And you can say, well, I don't have the money. Well, okay, so what's the solution? What don't you have the money? A home or a rent? What can we work towards? Should I need to take out a job so that we can afford this? And I'm ready to do that. So you and then the husband can't use the fact that I have to serve my parents. So she she has to serve her parents too. You can't use this excuse. Now this also depends on the parents themselves. Maybe they're terminally ill. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they need somebody to take care of them. So you can't just abandon uh, elderly people in Islam. It's just, it's a very complex discussion. That's not the, that's not solved with legality. That's not that's not solved with legality. person who asked the question about the dog, I already said that staying, meaning their living quarters, should be outside of the house. Their living quarters, meaning make them like in a, in a garage or something like that. It's not part of the house. They should be away from that house, according to a number of scholars. And the Maliki scholars have their own view. You can ask a Maliki scholar like Sheikh Sahih Web or somebody else with regards to Malikis. Allahu Alam. Should we eat first or pray? I heard the dinner should be prioritized. If food, uh, the Prophet says, "La salata bi ta'am," that there is no prayer when a person, uh, when food is brought, or when a person is thwarting off going to the bathroom, meaning they need to really use their bathroom and they're holding it. Okay, so there is no prayer. A person should eat. A person should eat, and then they can pray in jama'ah. If there's a bunch of people, they can pray jama'ah later. There's nothing wrong with that. So when the food is served, you eat food. Otherwise, your mind is, uh, the whole point of this is, what's the, what's the wisdom behind this? A person's mind is preoccupied with what? With food, with going to the bathroom the entire time. You lose khushur. You lose khushur. One of the three manifestations of knowledge. Remember that. Number one, number one is khushur. So obviously, if, it's, if that's with knowledge, what about, what about food? Do we give da'wah to non-Muslims? Yes, it's a responsibility of every single Muslim to be able to call others towards Islam in a way that is fitting and right and correct and in the right manner and po possible way. So some people think that calling to Muslims means you have to be on the street or holding a sign, enter the fold of Islam. That's not what it means. It means be a good example for others. Invite your neighbors to your house. Give them food, your friends, your co-workers, etc. Establish these relationships which bring about the conversations in which you can give them the message of Islam. And yes, the message of Islam means literal. It's not just, oh, we're nice to them and then therefore uh, we're fulfilling a responsibility. No, no, no. You have to give the message of Islam. This is responsibility for all Muslims. Okay, so with all of that, inshallah, I'm gonna because some of these questions require lectures on themselves. Jazakumullah khairu jazam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to implement what we've listened to and allow us to allow us to uh, reach the stages of manifestation of our knowledge in khushur and in zuhd and in tawadu'. May Allah azza wa jal make us of those that call to the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we are the first ones to practice it. And in this beautiful month of Rabi'ul Awal, may Allah send his peace and blessings on our Master and beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family and his companions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to spend time in this month to learn more about our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to learn about his seerah, to learn about his um, beautiful life and his characteristics and his manners and how he dealt with people and to go beyond the surface but to actually dig and to see his interactions with others inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khaira wa akhid da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka alhabibu wa nabiyu Muhammad. وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير